Drones are pretty cool. You can take pictures with them, you can race them against each other. Apparently you can even film the Olympics with them. But that takes a lot of skill. So much skill, in fact, that the FAA has a bunch of laws and regulations in place specifically designed for people who want to fly aircraft remotely. Now, just like real pilots, drone pilots have to understand the principles of flight, as well as how to read the weather forecast and observations and to understand airspace. So today at the Future Maker Lab, I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about how to understand airspace classifications. So how is airspace classified? And why are there so many different classifications? Well, one of the biggest reasons is that there are so many different things going up into the sky. You've got passenger planes, private jets, military operations, weather balloons, spaceships, and many, many more. So what does the government do? They break it up into different layers and sections and mark it all on sectional maps. In 1990, the ICAO created the current airspace classification system and the FAA followed along in 1993. Before that point, the US had over 20 different types of airspace, and I'm really glad they simplified it. There are two different categories of airspace, regulatory and non-regulatory. Regulatory airspace includes six different classes of airspace that are designated with a letter, A, B, C, D, E, and G. Class F airspace technically exists, but the FAA doesn't recognize it. Other types of regulatory airspace include prohibited areas and restricted areas. The other category is non-regulatory airspace, which includes MOAs, or military operation areas, warning areas, alert areas, and controlled firing areas. Now that being said, most drone pilots aren't intending to fly into controlled firing areas or MOAs, but they should be able to understand if they are flying in controlled or uncontrolled airspace. Classes A through E are controlled airspace, and Class G is uncontrolled airspace. Class A airspace is the easiest to understand, and it's the most consistent of the bunch. It starts at 18,000 feet MSL, or mean sea level, and the upper limit is 60,000 feet. It's a bit out of range for most remote drone pilots though, so let's move on. Class B airspace is a little more complex than Class A, and it's usually found around large airports. Class B airspace is denoted by a thick, solid blue line on sectional charts, and will typically run from the surface to 10,000 feet MSL. The shape of the airspace will depend on the location, but they typically look like an upside down wedding cake with different tiers starting at different heights, all marked MSL. Class C airspace is similar to Class B because it also has tiered layers, but it typically has fewer layers and only goes up to about 4,000 feet above the airport. Now that height still measured MSL, so you have to be able to read the height of the airport before you know how high the airspace above it is. And again, just like with Class B, operating in Class C airspace requires authorization. Class D airspace is almost like a repeat of the last two, but it's shorter and doesn't have any tiers or levels, so it's just a big invisible cylinder in the sky. Class D airspace is marked with dashed blue lines, not to be confused with the solid blue lines of Class B, and extends from the surface to 2,500 feet above the airport. Again, this has to be measured in MSL, and you have to have authorization to fly there. And then we come to Class E airspace, the most fluid of them all. Class E airspace is what sits between Class A and everything else below it, and it'll usually begin at 700 or 1200 feet above ground level. Sometimes Class E will go all the way down to the surface, which is much more common around non-towered airports, and you'll find that marked on sectional charts with dashed magenta lines. When Class E airspace is extending downward to 700 feet though, that's marked with a magenta gradient on the charts, and the lighter side of the magenta gradient denotes where Class E dips down. And finally, we come to Class G airspace, the one that drone pilots will fly in 99% of the time. Class G starts at the surface level and extends skyward to wherever Class E airspace begins, whether that's the usual 1,200 feet, 700 feet, or even 14,500 feet. That's right, Class G airspace can be as high as 14,500 feet MSL. You'll usually only find this over mountains or sparsely populated areas like Montana or Alaska, but sectional charts show this extension with a gradient blue line, where the darker side of the gradient represents the side where the Class G airspace extends upward. Remote drone pilots aren't allowed to fly above 400 feet without special permission from a local governing authority, such as air traffic control, if they are surveying an object that is taller than 400 feet, or in the case of an emergency that requires evasive action. However, if you do get that special permission, you get to go as high as they allow you to. Now there's a lot more to airspace than just these six classes, so leave us a comment if you'd like to, us to make more videos about airspace and flying. Also, if you're interested to learn more about drone piloting and flight, 
Check out WSU Tech's UAS courses to learn how to become a drone pilot. This has been Sam from Future Maker. See you next time.